So again, it's very important because all of these things are piling up on each other, right? And so the whole first month was thoughts. So we hit thoughts in every single possible angle. And you had homework to do, you had things to reflect. We were memorizing Psalms 1, right? How many of you were able to memorize Psalms 1? Hallelujah, look at that. Good, good. That's awesome. Why? We want to meditate and delight in the Word of God day and night, okay? So that we can be like planted trees who will bring forth fruit in its season, right? Whose leaves will not wither and everything that we do will prosper. But the wicked are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away, okay? So awesome. I'm glad you guys are able to, to memorize that. And so new month, month two, we did thoughts, and this month we're going to hit actions and habits. So thoughts become actions. Actions that you repeatedly do are your habits, and your habits form your character. So you and I are our habits. Now you have good habits, and you have really bad habits. And so we're going to better understand this whole conversation about actions and habits. And I really, really encourage that you join us during the week because this week specifically, we're gonna look more of like the scientific development of actions and habit. Whereas today, I'm just gonna give you an overview. Okay, so please, I encourage you to join us during the week. It's been great. I love the in-person between you and I. I like the in-person better, um, but, but do your best. And then it's always recorded. Sonia's been doing an awesome job at sending all of you guys that information. And any questions, right? Oh. Oh, Lynn. Okay, well, I sent it to Sonia, and then from there, I don't know what she does. it, But it's getting to you guys, right? Well, it's starting with her. She's carrying the baton to someone. All right. So anyways, excited to be here. If you have any questions on the first month, please fire away. Ask me. I want to answer these three months. I want you to think about it of like three months of intense therapy. That's what it is. This is what I do with my clients. And so I really hope that it's a blessing to you. All right. So here we go. Actions and habits, a word of prayer, and then we'll get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here together. I know we've had a long morning. It was Pathfinder Day, um, and I'm sure amazing things happened here in this church. And so, Lord, now we're together once again that we could further understand character. The first month we saw why we are trying to develop our character. We better understood our thoughts and how we can guard our thoughts by guarding the avenues of our soul our five senses. And so now, Lord, these thoughts, they will become actions and habits. And so be with us as we study this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Ellen White says this, actions repeated form habits. Habits form character. And by the character, our destiny for time and for eternity is decided. That's why character determines destiny. It's not your reputation, who people think you are. It's who you really are that will determine your destiny. Now, the cool thing about habits is that we could use it to our advantage or our disadvantage because scientists say that what our brain tries to do is it's constantly trying to make our lives easier. It's trying to save time and save energy and save effort. And so our brain is constantly trying to see things that we repeatedly do to make them into habits so that we don't have to think about it, so that we create a routine. And so truly, that's why making habits are hard, but once a habit sticks, for good or for evil, it really sticks. Our brains were made to be creatures of habits, creatures of liturgies, creatures of rituals. That's why we have the Sabbath, right? It's that weekly reminder, our clock, the way God created it works with weeks and months and years. There's a system, there's a routine, there's a ritual. Now, scientists estimate that about 40% of our activities are performed, performed each day in almost the same situation. So typically, the way you wake up looks the same. The way you eat looks the same. The way you do life over and over again has become habits and a lot of these fears and things, about 40% of those things look the same. Our lives, they are run by our habits. That's why habits aren't just for the disciplines. We all operate in 
habits. And usually those who are quote unquote disciplined, it's just because they've done a better job at creating habits of discipline, okay? Now, what is a habit? According to the Oxford Dictionary, it says it's a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. That's our challenge with habits. We can also say that it's a behavior that's become automatic, comfortable. It's part of who I am. It's part of who you are. Michael Horton says that character is largely a bundle of habits, of which Ellen White would agree. You and I are our habits. But our habits not only show our hearts, but they shape our hearts as well. Did you catch that? Our habits, they not only reveal our hearts, they show the integrity of our hearts, but they also shape my heart as well. And maybe um, you've done one of those New Year's resolution. Now, we're not going to do any more of this New Year's resolution. We're going to do New Year's habits. New Year's habits will stick way more than New Year's resolution will because there has been something in your life that you have wanted to change, that you know you needed to change, but it seems like you can never pull the trigger to change, right? There's just something in your life where it's harder, more difficult than others. Maybe that might be eating healthier or starting an exercise routine, or maybe it's that you want to stop scrolling aimlessly while you're in bed or sticking to a budget. Maybe it's the discipline of waking up and the first thing that you do every morning before you leave is that you're gonna spend time in Bible reading and in prayer. Maybe your new habit, it's going to be that you want to just respond differently. That usually you are a victim to people's reactions, right? And instead of being proactive, you're reactive and everything is someone else's problem or responsibility but our own. And so there seems to be a disconnect between our knowledge and desire and an actual experience of change. Do you notice that? Because you know what the right thing to do is. No one has a problem. Everyone knows what the right thing to do is. However, how many of us fail to do the right thing? Right? We know what the right thing to do is, but I have a hard time. I fail to do the right things. And that's because bad habits, my bad your bad habits, they constantly get in the way. They constantly get in the way. And as parents, as parents, and I know there are a lot of parents in here, the habits that we help our children create now will facilitate their life in the future. Oh man, it will facilitate their life in the future. We have adults who can't put broccoli in their mouths. That's a childhood habit. And so I'll give you a little example. I, had, I have twin boys, River and Reed, five years old, and one of the habits that we have is you have to eat whatever I put on your plate. Now, sure, after you've tried it a couple times, truly there are foods that you just, you just don't like. And fine, that's fair because we all have preferences. And so the principle is we need to eat healthy. Now, what that healthy looks like, maybe you choose the cauliflower over the broccoli, or maybe you want the sweet potato over the yams, whatever, but we eat healthy. And so I put the food in their plate and I say, listen, you don't have to eat it, but you can't put anything in your mouth until you finish your food first. That's a fair deal, right? You, you don't have to eat it, but you can only eat whatever you want to eat or something sweet or something after you eat this. And so sure enough, man, I have one who gives me a little more trouble. And my husband says it's because he's the one who looks a lot more like me. And he's, he's right on that one. And so he's sitting there and he's like, well, I want to go outside and play, but I don't want to eat. And I said, well, you don't have to eat. But again, what? We're doing habits, right? After you eat, there are things that happen. And before you eat, there are things that happen because we're creating rituals. We're creating habits. We're creating liturgy in our family. So you can go out to play after this gets done. Because then in the future, when it's like, I can leave my house after I spend time with God, right? Or I can start my day after I've brushed my teeth. Do you see how that works? And so it's easier when we habit stack. Habit stacking is the best thing. And if you haven't read the book Atomic Habit by James Clear, read it. It's a really great book. Okay. And so what happens, he's sitting there, he doesn't want to do it. And he starts to cry and we go back and forth. And now 15 minutes go by, 30 minutes go by, 
45 minutes go by and you know he's getting upset and then I send him for a time of reflection. I don't like the word timeout because it seems like it's a punishment, but really the reality is I need a timeout as an adult. I need to be able to say, hey, listen, I can't have this conversation right now. And so in order for me not to be nasty, let me take a timeout. In psychology, it's called psychological soothing, right? And so he's going to go psychologically soothe, okay? And so he goes there and he comes back and he's upset. And we do this. An hour goes by and we're going back and forth and my patience is dwindling. And so whenever he goes to his timeout, I go to my timeout and I say, Lord, I need the Holy Spirit of patience and self-control because I want to spank this kid. That's what I want to do. And there are moments, listen, I'm not against spanking by all means. I am not against it. You know, there are things that they repeatedly do. And when you start seeing it's becoming a part of their character, a spanking with mom's hand and with mom's love, not in anger, will feel way better than a spanking done out there. Okay, so I'm not against spanking, but for whatever reason, this time God says that's not what he needs. That's why as parents, it's not a one size fits all in terms of how you're going to deliver discipline and training to your children. It isn't because my kid is different than your kid. So we constantly need to be connected with the Holy Spirit. Say, you know what? This is not what Reed needs right now, Amanda. So here we go. An hour and an hour and 15 minute goes by. (sighs) And I feel like I'm like floating to heaven, right? Because I've been having so much patience right now. And Reed's like, can you help me stop crying? But I was also so upset and annoyed and frustrated that I literally told him, and I was being honest, I can't help you stop crying. Because the reality is I can't even help myself from keeping frustrated. I said, Reed, let's go on a walk. And, you know, he, and he goes back and forth. I don't want to go on a walk. Let's go on a golf cart ride. I'm like, Reed, we're going on a walk. And so we go to the mailbox, and he holds my hand, and he probably didn't want to hold my hand, and I probably didn't want to hold his hand either. But here it is. It's, it's an action. It's a habit. So we hold hands. And he said, well, let's go ask Jesus. Let's ask Jesus to give you control and to give mom patience. And I start to explain to him. I said, you know, the spirit of God gives us love, peace, joy, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And he looks at me. He goes, you're not being very patient. I said, read. I wanted to spank you the first 10 minutes. It's an hour and a half. Jesus is giving me patience. And he's like, oh, yeah, he really is. I said, yeah, he really is. He, re- he really is, my boy. The Holy Spirit is here right now because I, wa- I wanted to spank you the first 10 minutes. So we're walking, holding hands. We get to the mailbox, and he says, oh, look, I, I stopped. He, he, he was able to stop crying. He wasn't able. Christ threw him the hope of glory. So we come back, and he goes, well, I don't have to pray now because I stopped. I said, well, no, we have to now give thanks, right? You have to thank God that you're able to do it. And so he says, Jesus, thank you for giving me emotional control. Right? And so that's what it's all about. Creating habits. I can't help you. I can't help. But Jesus can help you. And so we create habits. We create actions. We create rituals and liturgies in our family so that our children know who to seek. But these habits start now. They start in infancy. And it's amazing when you're parents because there are things that you had a hard time overcoming. But when you have kids and you want them to overcome, then something happens to you as mothers, at fathers, that you're like, man, I want him to know that this is possible to overcome. And so Christ starts to work in us so that way we can give them an example, so that we can train a child in the way he should go. But in order for me to train, I need to have walked that path first. And so, again, what are habits? It's often, Ellen White says, often one neglect, often repeated, forms habits. Look at this. One neglect, often repeated, forms habits. Habits, actions that we repeat form habits. One wrong act prepares the way for another. The act repeated forms habits. So it's neglect to actions to habits. Now, what we need to make abundantly clear this evening is that good habits matter more than good intentions. Oh, man. Oh, man. Good habits matter more than good intentions. And she says in Desire of Ages, it is not enough to have good intentions. It is not enough to do what a man thinks is right or what the minister tells him is right. His soul salvation is at stake and he should search the scriptures for himself, for herself. However strong may be his convictions, however confident he may be that the minister knows what is truth, That is not his foundation. Our foundation is not in the pastor, in the minister, in my mom, in my dad, in the therapist, 
It's not in tonight's talk. Our foundation lies in the Word of God. And it says, He has a chart pointing out every way mark on the heavenward journey, and He ought not to guess at anything. You and I are not left, you know, as blind leading the blind. No, we are left with a guide, with a map, and good habits matter more than good intentions. Knowledge, I will also add, is insufficient. Think about it. Too often, we think that if only we could learn more, have more information. Information oftentimes does not lead to transformation. We have a lot of information, yes? We have a lot of knowledge, but at times we lack wisdom, applied knowledge. And so we have all the information, we have all the seminars, we have all the talks, all the TED Talks. All, we have so much information, but the reality is, unfortunately, we have churches filled with people who have Bible knowledge, but whose lives lack Christ-like transformation. Ellen White says it like this, a profession of religion places you in the church, but your character and conduct show whether you're connected to Christ. Oh, man, how good is that? Profession of religion, sure, place you, a knowledge. This is a good place to be, a good place to bring my children. This is why 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, stay away from such people. This is why the psalm says that we need to not only speak truth with our lips, but speak truth in our hearts. We speak truth in our heart, not just with our lips. So knowledge alone is not enough. Good intentions is not enough. We need to start getting our habits around these good intentions. We need to part habits behind our knowledge. What we know shapes us, but what we do shapes us as well. What you know, coming to church and hearing that information, that passing of knowledge, that reading, that, yes, absolutely, it changes you. But what you do also changes you. Knowledge needs to be paired with right habits. That's the message. Knowledge, information needs to be paired with right habits so that knowledge becomes wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge applied. Okay? And so Smith, he says this. In the end, we're driven by what we love and desire more than by what we think. Think about it. Oftentimes, you know what the right thing to do is, but you and I still do the wrong thing, even though in here we know what the right thing to do is because it seems like this pulls us astray. Right? Do you notice that? You have head knowledge about it, but why do you and I still do the wrong thing? Because it seems that we are driven more by what we love and desire than by what we think. And that's why God says, tells us to come and behold him, to come and spend, to come and worship him. Why? Because by worshiping, I desire and I love and then I act. God calls us into fellowship for that very reason. She, he continues, Smith argues that we'll only change our desires by changing our habits. Good, godly habits become woven into our character so that we begin to desire the right things. So it's not, I know the right thing, right? And I have all these good intentions. It's no, I create habits around good and right and principled and things of value. And then those habits, those actions will start changing the fabric of my character. That's how that works. And so that's why feeling doesn't even have to be put into play here. We are able to create habits regardless of feelings towards those habits. One of your assignments this past week was we started to create our identity, right? So everyone wrote down, I don't know, between three to five identities, things that you are or things that you would like to be. <coughs> okay, things that you are or things that you would like to be. With every identity statement, with every identity statement, you then created or chose a character word. With every character word, you then chose a Bible verse. And then I asked you this past week to think about what are your goals for each of these identities and what is your at least goal, right? Is everyone following? And so, for example, the one that I said with, with me as a wife, my goal is to be able to do the morning and evening walks with my husband, 
right? We like to do the walks. It's amazing. Either we, we see the stars or we see the sunset and it's awesome, right? So the goal is to do that daily walk together. But the at least goal, it's like, oh, the day someone was sick or we were traveling and there's something about walking in the ranch, okay? And so when there's no noise, when you hear the birds and you're in nature, and so typically when we're traveling or we're doing an Airbnb deal, we're not doing those walks. So the at least is, but at least we'll shower together. And he probably likes the at least than the goal much better. Okay, and so it's like, hey, at least we were able to talk and connect here while we're sharing together. So you create your goal for your identity and your at least goal so that when you lay your head at night, what have you been doing? You've been casting votes on the person you want to become. That's why it doesn't matter who you were. It doesn't even matter who you are. I can change and you can change the trajectory of your life simply by creating new habits. These are identity statements. That's why in his book, um, Atomic Habits, James Clear, he talks about two groups of people who are trying to stop smoking. And so these men, these women, they stayed a couple of weeks without smoking and they were using the patch and this and that. And towards the end, some of the scientists went up and they would say this, hey, would you want to smoke? The first group says, no man, I'm trying to quit. The second group says, no thanks, I'm not a smoker. Do you see the difference? One is I'm trying to stop smoking. The other one is I'm not a smoker. And so if you're not a smoker, smokers don't smoke. Does that make sense? And so that's why we start taking these identity statements. That's why even if you don't feel like you're there, you're like, well, you know, I would love for one of my identities to be athlete, but I don't feel very much like an athlete. And so you start to think, well, what does an athlete do? Well, an athlete works out, okay, and so I'm going to start doing that. I'm going to start, you know, faking it till I make it kind of thing. And what does an athlete do? They're probably going to choose better options when they eat, okay, they're probably going to sleep early to recover their body. And so you start to come up with habits of what an athletic does. Or maybe you're thinking, you know, I have an identity of a mother, but I've never had a good mother growing up. Maybe you're thinking that, so how am I supposed to know? Well, what do you think a good mother looks like? What do you think a good mother acts like? How do you think a good mother speaks? And so you start writing down all of these habits, and now your identity starts to create a foundation here, not because of good intentions, but because of right habits. Okay? And so it says this, Ellen White, to become virtuous is to internalize the law so that you follow it more or less automatically. And then Smith continues, it becomes second nature, which implies that our first nature isn't what it's meant to be. In other words, we don't change through thinking, we change by, think we change by changing what we love and we change what we love through habits. If you wanna know what someone loves, pay attention to their habits. If you want to know who you are, pay attention to what you do on your free time. Pay attention to what you do on your free time. That'll start giving you a glimpse and an idea to really what is guiding and leading your hearts. Because habits aren't just what we do, but they do something to us. Habits either are forming us or they are deforming us. And as Christians, we need a lot of deforming. Why? It's kind of like when the Israelites left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave the Israelites, you know, that sort of thing. And so a part of making habits is less about creating habits and more about getting rid of habits. But if I'm going to get rid of habits, I need to exchange. I need to exchange. If I have a client who's an alcoholic or a drug addict and they spend all of their time and energy trying to get that drug, trying to get the next high, and if that is removed, now they have too many hours in their day, right? And so now we have to exchange. We have to create other habits. There's a story in the Bible where it says that a woman that she was demon possessed. And after she was released of all of these demons, she was clean for a while. And that the demons, they were roaming and stroming. And they looked at each other and said, hey, I wonder, I wonder how, how she's doing, right? Look at them, like good demons. They're going to go check in on her. I wonder how she's doing. And so it says that they go back 
And they saw that the house was clean, swept, and put in order. And then the Bible reads, and her situation was now worse than it was before. And you're thinking, well, what? Why? Clean, swept, and put in order seems like, seems like good stuff. She had no furniture. All she did was create more space, right? So we need to start filling and filling and filling. That's why we meditate. That's why we memorize the Word of God. I don't want you to empty your mind. No, for, for the love of God, don't empty your mind. We need to fill our mind, fill our mind, and fill it with truth. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. The truth will set you free. That's why we want to spend time, meditate, and memorize the Bible so it's part of our very being. So that way, when I act, I act in accordance of the Bible. When I choose, when I speak, when I walk, when I talk, I act in accordance to Scripture. Mike Cosper, to experience the richness of life in God's kingdom, we must reorder our lives. We need to see through the shallow promises of our culture, and we need rhythms, signposts, and practices that reorient us to another world. That's what the Sabbath does. The Sabbath reorients us. The Sabbath points us. It's that rhythm. It's that practice. It's after an entire week, maybe, and you just failed and failed and failed, and then you come and you're filled again. And then you take that filling and hopefully you start putting habits because truly you need to do a lot more filling during the week than one time during the Sabbath, but it can start here. And so that's why we do rituals. There's such a cool ritual that... Um, the Jewish people used to do, and I believe they continue to do, it's the practice of blessing our children. I don't know if you've ever read a book. It's called, um, oh, man, I'm going to, I can't remember. The Power, the Power of a Parent's Blessing. Have you ever read that book? Phenomenal book. I'll send it as one of the recommendations there. And there it says a practice of at least once a week for you to bless your child. We spend all week saying, no, don't do this. You can't do this. You can't do that. But when you take a day, we like to do it Friday nights, and you just bless that boy. You bless that girl. You look into their eyes. And what are you doing? You're reorienting them. You're putting signposts in their lives. You're giving them a new rhythm. You're speaking identity to them, because if you don't speak identity, the world will speak identity. And then I will become who I think I am, who I've chosen to be. And so I'm going to start acting and behaving by the identity I've taken on. For example, no, I'm not a smoker, so I don't smoke. Make sense? Okay. So the idea is that habits that we create will then become a second nature, and that these practices will become our postures and that it'll start to become natural because maybe I don't feel like it right now, but after I do it over and over and over again, I'm going to start taking on that identity. That's why that second group was able to say, no, I'm not a smoker, but they were just a couple of weeks ago. But why are they not anymore? Because their habits change their identity. So that's what we need to do. Our habits help aim our desire and loves in a specific direction. Another book that I'm going to recommend is a book um, by, I'm going to, oh, here it is. I have it right here. It's called You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit by James K.A. Smith. Phenomenal book. And it's all about that, creating rituals and liturgies and moments of worship in your family because you and I will become what we worship. And what we worship is what we love. Does that make sense? And that's why knowledge alone is not enough because I genuinely know what the right thing to do is, but my heart and my desires, the thing that I love, chooses oftentimes more than what I know to be the right thing. And so here it is. When something becomes a habit, the fight becomes a little easier over time. And that's the idea. That's why justification works like this, right? Imagine that we are in the mud and Jesus comes to the mud and he takes us out of the mud. Right? That's justification. It's what he has done on the cross for me. I was there in the mud, in the bog of despair, right? Pilgrim's Progress. Have you guys read Pilgrim's Progress? Oh, so good. My you know, hyper, if they went to school, they'd probably want to medicate them with all sorts of things because they can't sit still. My little ADHD, DD, ADW, XYZ boys who are climbing trees and just acting crazy half the time, 
they will sit down next to me through the all the three books and if you had the, the kid version of it it's called little pilgrim's progress if you have children you need to buy little pilgrim's progress it's incredible and then it talks right it's an allegory and so after every chapter there's 10 chapters in each of these books there's three parts and it'll give you like questions for you to do with your family yes there are some things that we're gonna have to do a little little tweaking but the substance is great and you should get it because, again, I mean, River and Reed, will, they will sit down and read 30 chapters of this thing and they won't even blink. They won't even blink. And so um, it's an incredible little book. And so what is, what is it saying right here, right? Over time, it'll become easier. But that's the work of justification. It's I'm in the bog. I'm in the mud. And through what Jesus has won for me, I didn't, I didn't do anything to receive it. It's called grace. It's called a gift. If I purchase a gift, it's no longer a gift. And so that's justification. He pulls me out of the mud. Sanctification is he starts taking the mud out of me, right? So there's mud in my heart. There's mud in my mind. There's mud in me. And sanctification is he's cleaning and he's taking it away. And habits will help us do that. Because like Paul says, man, I want to do what I shouldn't do. And it's this evil inside of me. And here is the reality. You know, this is going to be a tricky question. Do you and I have free will? Yes or no? Yes. Think about it. Do we have free will? You know, and we think, yeah, but now think about it. Someone who's addicted to cocaine, do they have free will to choose when to do it and when not to do it? Do they have free will? Or has that completely overtaken them in a way where now... They're not choosing. How many times I've stood in front of someone and said, I don't want to do it. That's what Paul says, right? Paul says, I want to do the right thing, but it's this evil inside of me, and I end up doing what I don't want to do. And so what, that's why good intentions are not enough. Because it seems sometimes that we've created so many bad habits that really it seems like we don't have willpower at all. It seems like we don't have freedom at all because freedom is being able to choose and decide what God has created us to be. And the reality is more times than not, we choose against our identity. We're like slaves to sin. We want to do the right thing, but we do the wrong thing. So it almost seems like, man, it, sometimes it feels like I don't even have free will. Sometimes it seems like I don't have willpower because I keep going like a dog returns to his vomit so a fool returns to his folly. Isn't that sometimes our experience and our reality? Yes, God has given you and I free will. We have the ability to choose, but because of so many bad habits, it seems like we have paralyzed that ability. That's why we have to create habits. That's why we can't just have good intentions. We can't just operate on autopilot here. No, we have to create good habits so that it changes, it reorients us, it gives us rituals and, and signposts so that we go back to what God wanted. One of my favorite quotes is, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. And true freedom is operating in the way that God designed us to operate. That's true freedom. Not this washed down version that the world offers of us freedom. No, 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 no. Because we think we're free, but only to realize we are slaves to our bad habits. We are slaves to our desires. We are slaves to our lust. We are slaves to our cultivated and hereditary tendencies. But all of these things will meet their match in Jesus Christ. Amen. All of them will meet their match. That's why if you read 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, 1 John, says, 1 John 3 says, I think it's verse 17, if you abide in me, you do not sin. And you think, wait, that's, a, that's loaded. What do you mean? Because I seem to be sinning all the time. If you abide in me, you will not sin. Why? Because if the Spirit of God is in me, does the Holy Spirit sin? No. The Holy Spirit doesn't sin. I sin. But the Holy Spirit doesn't sin. So the Holy Spirit working in me, he reorients my identity. He reorients my choices. And so usually the question is, 
Do you want the Holy Spirit? And everyone's knee-jerk reaction is, yes, hallelujah, hallelujah, a double portion of it, Elisha, right? Give me a double portion of the Holy Spirit. Yes, please. But now think about it. Do I want the Holy Spirit? I know you want the blessings and the benefits. I want the blessings. I want, the, But do we want the Holy Spirit, a spirit other than our own, to possess our bodies? Do I want the Holy Spirit? Because the second the Holy Spirit comes in, he's not going to be okay with any self-sins, self-pity, self-righteousness, self-victimization, self-worship. There's no self-sins when the Holy Spirit comes in. Now we start thinking, when the Holy Spirit comes in, you don't get to choose what you eat. You don't get to choose what you wear. You don't get to choose how you parent. You don't get to choose what you say and how you act. And if you're going to forgive or not forgive, the Holy Spirit does the choosing. Amen. He's the one who decides. And so now you start to think, oh, man, do I really want the Holy Spirit inside of me? You need to hand over, here, Lord, here's the keys to my house. Here's the keys to my job. Here's the keys to my marriage. Here's the keys to my church. Here's the keys to my profession. You choose what I'm going to be when I grow up. You choose who I'm going to marry. You choose who I'm going to befriend or not be friends with. When the Holy Spirit comes in, he's in charge and he does the choosing. And we are never so free than when the Holy Spirit does the choosing. But you and I, I'm scared to death. Because the reality is my, my desires oftentimes are at war against the Spirit of God. And so someone has to die. Someone has to die. Two people, two people can't drive the car here. Two people can't leave. Two people can't choose. If, if someone is putting a yoke on me, it's not going to work if we're going different directions. And so someone has got to die. And my prayer is that someone is me. And my prayer is that that someone is you, but that's hard. Do you really want a spirit other than yourself to take possession over you where everything that you do is in accordance to what he wants. Sure, the Holy Spirit comes with peace and goodness and kindness and gentleness and all this good stuff, but you and I were so wicked. Our hearts are so wicked and deceitful mm -hmm. that we, can't even, we don't even know our left hand from our right hand. We call good evil and evil good. Eve called that which would kill her good. Remember Ahan, after they went there, and Joshua went, and they overcame the, the, the town, the city, whatever, and he buried all the things that God said do not keep, and he called it a goodly Babylonian robe, the very thing that would kill him and all of his family. We call good evil and evil good. And this is why... When something becomes a habit, the fight becomes a little easier over time. But in order to break a habit, that's hard work. That's difficult work. This is why addiction and bad patterns are so hard to break. We form ways of responding or choosing that become cemented in our minds, in our brains, and in our hearts that over time is very hard to re rewire. Can you teach an old dog new tricks? You can but it's harder, but it's harder. And so now is the time to form good habits. Parents, now is the time to instill good habits. I'm okay with being the bad cop. I'm okay with not being liked by my children. In Portuguese, we'd say it like this, a repreensão é um ato de amor. Discipline is an act of love. Discipline isn't, we don't discipline who we think is a waste of our time. We discipline who we love. And if my children are anything like me, God's discipline hurts. When we look at John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He who is in me, the branch that is in me and does not bear fruit, Maybe your, maybe your Bible says he throws away. But really, the original says he lifts up. So I don't know who gardens here, but whenever things are garden, yeah, Suji garden. I saw her garden. She has an amazing garden, right? And so Suji, correct me if I'm wrong, but we want things to shoot up. But sometimes 
they're stubborn, and so they start to fall over. And if they fall over, they're going to get its nutrients from the soil. But I don't want the nutrients from the soil. I want it from the vine. And so what do I do? I lift it up. And so the tomatoes, right, we have to sometimes like stick it so it goes up. And so if you are in the branch, if you are the branch and the true vine, and you're not producing fruits, you're going to be lifted up. And that's painful. That's hard. No one wants that. And then it goes on. And the branches that abide in me who are bearing fruit, my father will prune that it might bear more fruit. Pruning does not feel good. Pruning is not fun. And pruning is a little crazy. Sometimes like River and Rudy have to prune like, no, don't take it out because it looks like good. It looks like good stuff. But if I don't take it out, I'm not going to be able to get even more fruit. And so the father disciplines who he loves. And you and I need to be lifted up if we're not producing fruit. And if we're producing fruit, buckle up because now we're going to be pruned. And he's going to prune every which way because he wants to multiply your good fruits for his glory, for his glory. And so it says, bad habits are more easily formed than good ones and are given up and are given up with more difficulty. It takes far less time and pain to spoil the disposition of a child than it does to imprint principles and habits of righteousness upon the tablets of their soul, Ellen White. It is only by constantly watching and counterworking the wrong that we can hope to make the disposition right. Bad habits, when conquered, will offer the most vigorous resistance. But if the warfare is kept up with energy and perseverance, they may be conquered. Forming a new habit is a tremendous draw on your willpower reserves. Initially, the new behavior may be physically or mentally challenging. It will cut against the grain of your natural inclinations. It takes effort, lots of it. Of course it does. And a lot of us, we are trying to redo and retrain and recreate neural pathways in our brain because unfortunately, they weren't created for us. Maybe no one helped you. And now you're thinking, oh, this is so difficult. This is so hard. And it is so difficult. And it is so hard. That's why it can't just be a matter of, oh, I wish it was differently. It can't be a matter of good intentions and good hoping and New Year's resolution. New Year's resolution does nothing without a plan. Habits are the plan. Habits are the way. Habits is what God uses because at, at first it's hard. But once that habit gets ingrained, then it becomes easier. And so habits will work for us or against us. We will be slaves to good habits or we will be slaves to bad habits, but slaves nonetheless. A few more remarks from Ellen White before we close. She says this, The only security for any soul is right thinking. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And that's why you start to take on an identity. And when you take on an identity, then it goes back to the thought stuff, which is, what are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you eating? What are you touching? What are you smelling? All of your five senses are affecting the quality of your thoughts, which are affecting the quality of your actions and your habits. And so thoughts produce action, but actions also change your thoughts. And so habits is my ability to choose, to choose, using my willpower, right, to choose even though it seems like there's a choice being made other than myself. She continues, the power of self-restraint strengthens by exercise. Remember that little video that I sent you guys? That video is like three, a little less than four minutes long about the interior complex and how whenever we do what we don't want to do, we strengthen it. You have to watch that video. That is a tremendous video showing what? That muscles will be strengthened when we go against that which we want to do in order for us to make bets on what God has called us to be. And she says, initially the new behavior may be physically or mentally challenging. It will cut against the grain of our natural inclination. And that's why the soul's only security is as a man thinks, so he is. That which at first seems difficult by, look at this, constant reputation grows easy and right thoughts and actions become habitual. That's why it needs to be something that is done every single day. And this week we will see it's made easier when you habit stack. 
There are things that you already do habitually. And so when you want to create a new habit, it's easier if you piggyback on a habit that has already been formed. Does that make sense? And so we're going to look a lot at that during the week. So please, please join us. And then here's the last one. And then I'm going to open it for questions. By beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are actually to be changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We expect too little, and we receive according to our faith. We are not to cling to our own ways, our own plans, our own ideas. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Besetting sins are to be conquered and evil habits overcome. Wrong dispositions and feelings are to be rooted out and holy tempers and emotions begotten in us by the Spirit of God. Christ in me, the hope of glory. The only way for this to work, the only safe path here is the path of obedience. That's it. The only safe path is the path of radical obedience to a thus saith the Lord. That's it. And that's why we continuously go back to the word of God, to the word of God, to memorize the word of God, to spend time, to delight, to meditate. Because 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 19 says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it is profitable. What is the scripture profitable for? First one, for teaching. Teaching what? Teaching what is right. When you read the Bible, it's profitable to teach you, to tell you, to show you. This is the right way. This is the right path. Then it's also profitable for reproof, meaning this is the wrong way. This is the wrong stuff. So it teaches me what is right, and then it teaches me what is wrong. And then it says it's also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. It teaches me how to make the wrong into a right. So it teaches me the wrong, it teaches me the right, and it teaches me how to change the wrong to the right. And then the last part, and it's also profitable for instruction and righteousness, meaning once I've known what's right, once I've known what's wrong, once I've righted my wrongs, then it teaches me how to stay on the path of righteousness, the path of right doing. And then it closes in verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we come to the Word of God, because there we look at the Word of God and we look at our habits, and we see, man, this habit is not good. This habit is good. How can I change this bad habit to a good habit? And once I've done that, how can I stay in the path of righteousness, the path of right habits? Okay, so that's our beginning here of actions and habits. Um, again, I'm going to send the information. There's an article that I want you guys to read. Then um, we're going, I want you guys to create a game plan for your goal and your at least goal. What is this game plan going to look like? Now you're going to put it on paper. So imagine you already have your identities, you have your character words, you have your verses, you have your goal, and you have your at least goal. Now I want you to throw it into your schedule. So it's going to look like as soon as River and Reed go to bed, that cues my mind to say, oh, time to walk with Renee. Does that make sense? So we're going to already look at your schedule, already see habitual practices, rituals that you already have, like waking up in the morning and maybe the first thing you do is you drink warm, you know, lemon water with chia. Okay? Maybe that's what you do. And so that habitual practice will now, boom, it'll cue something else. Okay, maybe it's upon waking up, you already have a habit of knees hit the floor. It's prayer. So you are going to add your goals and your at least goals to your schedule. Okay, that's going to be the reflect part. And then the retain this month, we are going to be memorizing Titus 2 verses 11 through 14. And it says this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, 
looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us for every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. That's what habits is all about. That's what action is all about. It's habits. It's works. Read James. Look at what James says. James, it, show me your works. I'll show you my faith. Show me my faith. I'll show you my works. Your faith is dead if it's not accompanied by works. I have the Ellen White Bible, and in the beginning she says this, it's better that you have no faith than that you would have faith with no works. And so that's why Titus 2 is a reminder that we need good works because the mouth will speak out of the abundance of the heart. Okay, and then I give some, for this one particular, particularly, I give some book recommendations that you guys can, can take a look at. And please, please, session number two, we are going to start off. So maybe I'll give you a hook and be like, oh my goodness, I can't wait for session number two. It's this. I'm going to start off with three common denominators in families where kids continued in their faith as adults. There are three things that you can create as a habit in your family that will ensure that your children will keep their faith as adults. Was that a good hook? Yeah. Are you guys like, oh my goodness, I can't wait for Friday. Okay, perfect, awesome. All right, let me pray and then we'll, we'll do some questions. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, oh man, good intentions are not enough. Knowledge alone is not enough. And the reality is here in this church, we know a lot of stuff. We know a lot of Bible stuff. We will excel in Bible trivia. The other day I was looking at a, at a Bible trivia game where they would memorize verses and ask questions. And I got a lot of those questions. I mean, 9 out of 10. There's a lot of information here amongst our Seventh-day Adventist people. We are people of the book. But Lord, may this knowledge become wisdom. May the power that we confess with our mouths be the power that is seen in our hearts through our actions and through our habits. Yes, a profession of religion places men in the church, but character and conduct show whether they are connected to Christ. May we abide in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All righty. Any questions? There's a mic back there if there are any questions. I want to... Oh, sorry. I want to say... If we do have a question, raise your hand so we can get the mics to you because people online want to also hear what the questions are. Awesome. Hey, if no questions, then I thoroughly did what I was supposed to do here today. Oh, we have a question here. Oh, hi. Hi. So, like, last week was the first week of your workshop? Or no, so it started the first week of last month. So technically today is session number five, mm -hmm. right? But it's all recorded and it's all online, okay. right? So the first one was done here at the church and then the three that follow is on Zoom. And so today, once a month here, and then the next following Fridays at 8 p.m. will be online. So I, okay. It'll give, okay. And so, and again, good question. Everything is recorded. Everything is there. So if you miss something, go back and watch it. So, because truly, like, it piles up. Okay? Okay? Going once. Going twice. Oh, ooh. So I have a question. Yes. For anxiety... Uh, what kind of habit or what can I try and uh, create to try and not get anxious or something like that? Okay, so good question. So let's define anxiety, right? I like to say that anxiety is an exaggerated belief of something that may or may not happen in the future, okay? And I also really like anxiety for this reason. Anxiety, if we look at it, it's an alert. It's an alarm. So imagine if in your house you have a fire detector and there's fire, you want that thing to go off because it's going to alert you there is fire in this house, right? But the second in which you have a fire and the alarm does not work, now the whole house falls. We're all dead. But the most annoying thing in the world would be for that 
alarm to go off when there is no fire. And it's going off every single night and it's waking you up every single night. And so the first thing is look at it as anxiety as a friend in the beginning to see what is wrong, what is off. Because typically it's alerting us of something that is not okay. Usually when we have externalized behaviors, maybe you know a young person is starting to cut themselves. I don't want anyone cutting themselves, but that gives me an indication that there's something there, right? And it's, it, it's, a, it's a behavior of a deeper root. So first, in your quiet time with God, say, what is it? What, what, what is my body trying to alert me? Like befriend it. Come to it as in a place of like, it's trying to tell me something. And then from then on there, you can do specific things. And I can send you specifically a list of like breathing exercises. So as soon as anxiety hits, and it, different things will work for different people. That's why you have to see what works for you. For some people, breathing works. For some people, as they start naming what's in their room, if their heart is beating very, very fast, we want to try to bring the breathing down. And so say, tell me what you see. Oh, I see a door. And over there, I see a portrait of Jesus as the ultimate doctor. Here, I see the resurrection. So you start pointing out to bring your body down. For other people, if they have a stimulus, so some people when they're very anxious, they like to hold something that's very cold or something that's very warm, right? Because it's, it's all thoughts. And we know that thoughts will become actions. And the ultimate to me is memorizing Bible verses, right? So specifically choose verses that talk about anxiety and about being in the present, about all things will always work out for the good of those who love Christ. And so memorization, then you can do a breathing exercise or we'll see which one works best for you. And I would spend time with it and be like, what is my body trying to teach me? What is it trying to show me? You know, after maybe you're doing some type of, of a, a juice thing. I, I was with some of the girls and we were, were doing a 10 day of juicing, right? And one of the girls says, oh my goodness, I have the, the first three days she had the absolute worst headache. And the reason why she had the worst headache is because she loves sugar. And so do you see what I'm saying? And so like, why did she, oh, that headache was so bad. No, look at, she's detoxing from something. She's having the worst migraines of her absolute life. But that migraine was so good because now after these 10 days, she's like, man, like, I don't, I don't want to be eating so much of that. So that was good. I'm like, oh, yes, I loved your headache. It wasn't fun for her to experience it, but she was able to see a consequence in these 10 days of juicing that she before would have never seen. So that headache served its purpose. So if anxiety comes to serve its purpose, then it's only gonna go off when there's actually fire. But if we ignore it, if we keep pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off, it's gonna be beeping every single night. Make sense? Yes. I have a question about, um, you're talking about habits, but there's like, for example, personality disorders like OC, um, OCD, PD, um, that maybe your, your brain is almost like hardwired a certain way. Mm -hmm. And to do or to overcome certain habits, it's like, it's harder or it's like you, another example, um, let me see if I can explain this properly, is if I'm um, a person that learns by doing something so you can explain it to me. You, I can read it in a book. I can read the instructions and I'll get like mm -hmm. a portion of it. But until I'm physically doing it, like, I don't know, learning to um, ride in a canoe, until I physically get in the canoe and mm -hmm. do it, my mind won't like engage and like it won't click. It won't. So for people that have that type of... Um, like a personality, I say maybe, is that a hindrance or is that an issue for learning a better habit or being able to do something? So for, if for that specific example, I think habits would be the best thing because habits takes away the wishing, praying, hoping, and it puts it into actions. And so you are going to get in the boat. That's what I was telling her, right? There's so many different ways. Like for some people, they like breathing exercise, but some people are more physical. And so that's why they want to hold something cold in their hand. So different things will work for different people. And I get that maybe, you know, an OCD or different types of personality disorders or different type of, you know, mental disorders, whatever. Then maybe we'll look into getting some special form of help, you know. Um, but... Even, even with things like that, habits will always sort of be what people fall back onto, 
right? So like even like if, if I'm like anxious and I'm, turn, and I'm making sure 500 different times if the door is closed, if the door is closed, that's a habit, right? That's a habit. Now that habit, because it's ingrained or maybe because it started from a place of trauma or from a place of fear or from a place um, in hereditary or in your environment or cultivate, whatever, um, it might be harder to overcome, yes, and there might be special um, steps to be taken, maybe like a therapist, a psychologist, you know, so you'd want to do that. But if the personality is, I need to physically do something, I need to like sit in the boat, then habits are the best thing. Did that? Yeah, that kind of makes me think. Okay. okay. Yes, over here. You said that justification is Jesus pulling us out of the mud. What was the sanctification part again? Sanctification is him taking the mud out of us. Okay. Right? So justification, he pulls us out on the cross. We're justified, not because of what we did, but because of what he did. He, he closed us with his robe, right? And then sanctification is taking the mud out of us. So think Israelites. Jesus took them out of Egypt, but then he had to take Egypt out of their hearts. Right? And that second part was a bit trickier. <laughs> oh, the first part was like, no, I mean, they stay there for a long time, but them coming out of it was fairly, uh, you know, the time frame was fairly small and compared to how much energy and effort and work it took from taking Egypt out of their hearts. Can you imagine they're in the desert? They stay 40 years, right? And they're in the desert like, oh, man, oh, we miss getting, you know, whipped in our backs. <laughs> Essentially, that's what they were saying, right? You brought us here to die. It was way better for us in Egypt. What was better? Getting whipped, getting beaten, not ha like, oh, we loved it. They were so good. That's why we call evil good and good. E we're so out of whack. Do you see where it almost feels like someone like that doesn't have, like, freedom of choice? It's like the sin is so, it, like, how could you not see it? To us, it's so obvious. Why would you ever want to go back to Egypt? You were slaves. You were being treated like dogs. Like, that was the worst place ever. And here you are, and you just saw, you know, manna from the heavens and water from the rocks, and you're craving Egypt. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. doesn't make any sense. But that's you and I, right? I don't know how many times you guys, but I, I, a couple of times I've returned to my vomit. Right? I've returned to my vomit a couple of times. And so what is that? I've returned to Egypt a couple of times. You would see that a lot in therapy, huh? Oh, well, I've seen it myself first, and then, yeah. <laughs> One more? So you talked about creating habits in our kids mm -hmm. to get them creating habits. But it takes a lot of repeating to, yes. for the little ones to start actually mm -hmm. learning. So let's say we start creating those habits, but there are other kids that also influence our kids. Like let's say we create one habit to not run in church, for okay. example. Mm -hmm. And then we go to a different church and then all of a sudden kids are running in their church and they just join mm -hmm. like without even thinking. What is your suggestions on like when we're in an environment where the habits that we are teaching are different mm -hmm. than what we are trying to teach, to, to install in them. Yeah, so that's, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be difficult, here's why, right? If I do this, if I say, everyone touch their elbows, like, you're, no one moved, no one moved, but if I would've said, everyone do as I do, Touch your elbows. If I would have said, and you can test it with little kids, they'll do studies on this. Whatever the person says is not going to be what is done. Whatever the person does is going to be what it's, what it's done. And so truly, habits are going to work well at home if we're constantly doing the habits, me, myself, passing on to River and Reed. But truly, now you get into an environment where the friends aren't doing it with words, they're doing it with action, so it's easy for them to imitate that. But when I come home, it's an opportunity for me to see, hey, that habit needs more working. That I love, I love moments where something I teach at home, and then it's like you, you get to test it, right? And isn't that what habits are for all of us? Isn't that ultimately what, when Joseph decided that he was going to remain faithful to God, it was easy to remain faithful to God when there wasn't a hot babe after you. 
But as soon as the hot babe comes after you, you and you remain faithful to God, you're like, that man really remained faithful to God. It was like a testing, right? And so Adam and Eve. We would never be able to say Adam and Eve were obedient if there was not a tree to be disobedient, right? And so essentially we're putting our kids in situations where it's situations where we're still a part of, and that's why I think it's so important that we're constantly present in these environments because now I get to see them like, mm, I didn't like that. And so now I get to come home and I get to do it again and do it again and do it again. Maybe next time they're going to do, do it at a different place. And now, oh my goodness, did you see how differently he acted there than he acted? And we're constantly tweaking. Like, and that's why, you know, uh, the, mo the more and more we can stay with our kids, not only in quality time, but in quantity time, it's helpful. Like I've learned, for example, for Reed that timeout doesn't work for Reed. Okay. So I don't put Reed in timeout for Reed when he's all acting crazy, but two things also to work because timeouts doesn't work for Reed and he gets very extremely hurt with spanking because his love language is touch. And so I'm using something that I demonstrate kindness to him and then I'm spanking him. Oh, it's like he really struggles. But I found the perfect thing for Reed. Reed is, su he's industrious. He's such like a, a hands-on kind of guy. And so whenever he starts acting silly or crazy or too much, I just say, Reed, go take, or he's crying and he's cranky and he's saying nasty things to his brother. I said, Reed, go to the, go to the mailbox. You know how far my mailbox is, yeah. right? So he, and he does it so upset and he walks to the mail and like he's crying and you know, he's fuming out of the mouth. And usually he runs back. I kid you not, when he runs back, he's a different person. He's a completely different person. Like, and for him, that's but but it took me time living with him. I've only been with him for five years to learn what works best with him. So the same thing. I'm doing all these rituals, all these habits at the house. They go outside and they're not acting the way we've been acting at the house. What other way? Maybe I can throw another sense to the habit, right? The same way that our five senses um, harm us or hurt us. And so it's like, okay, this habit was created just through, like what you're saying, I'm a, I'm a hands-on person, right? So maybe that habit was being created only auditorily or, you know, th through eating. But now we can involve all the senses to try to make it even a firmer foundation. And then you test it. So then you put it in a different environment and you're watching, okay, that, that needs a little more, bit more working. And that's going to be sanctification, which is the work of a lifetime. That's what God does to us, right? He puts us in here. Ooh, that was good. He puts us in here. Oh, very good. You overcame that temptation. Oh my goodness, that temptation, which would, in your past, it would have killed you. You know, it would have laid you flat. You just overcame. Or maybe, we know this as a mother, as mothers, our ability to withstand high amounts of noise has greatly increased. Right? And so before, my goodness, I, I hated loud noise, and I still do, but my ability to withstand loud noise is much different than it was before I had kids. You know, when like a bunch of people in the restaurant and their kids are like literally doing backflips on the table, and everyone's like, do they not see? Like parents are like immune, you know, like they don't even see it anymore, right? And so the same thing, just teach a habit, work on a habit, put them in an environment, come back, tr you know, tweak, 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 tweak. But think about it. Is it always po like the easier thing would be is for God to remove at us out of this toxic environment, right? But like God doesn't remove us from earth, from the world. He just says be in the world, but not of the world. So it's the same thing, right? It, it like it, 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 it may, if it's not in church, it's going to be at school. What if they're homeschooled? Then it might be at the in-laws' house, who's they're so out of whack over there. You know, like at some point, at some point. We're going to encounter it. And so I always say, I cannot control the circumstances. I can try to help change character. Yeah, it's the self-control thing. Yeah, it's the Joseph thing, right? Like, it didn't matter where he was. And would you rather know that your kid is doing the right thing just because he's in an environment, you know, that is, or would, you, or would it be much more amazing? And then I saw God in you, that you were in the worst of place and you still acted with character and with conduct and, you know, but, yes. I can actually speak to that, Diani, because my mom was, um, she read a lot of books when she was pregnant with me and she actually did a lot of uh, things to like train your child. So I feel like repetition and just keep doing it. And because I know like you want to do it, like when I got older, I wanted to do stuff because you know, everybody's doing it. But then it was like something inside of me was like, you know what? No. 
and like I, I went back to my family and, and what I had learned at home. There's a good country song. It's called I Hear Voices, and it's not because he's schizophrenic. You know, it's I hear voices, and it's like my dad and my grandma and my mom, and truly, like, they will hear voices. The other day I had a teenager says, I really wanted to do it, but I just had my mom in my head. And I said, wait, are you, I don't know, are you saying it like it's a bad thing? Because I'm saying, like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Right? She's like, oh, I wanted to do it so bad, but then I just, I rem my mom just kept playing over and over and over again in my mind. I said, yeah, hallelujah, you know, may she keep playing over. So yes, and that's hard, right? Because repetition, repetition of every single day, every, but kids are good because they'll pick up on habits quickly. You know, one of the habits, and you know, this is all kudos to Renee, was just worship in the morning, and he was able to pair it with a habit. And so River and Ray, they love their smoothies in the morning. And so they will only, I kid you not, it, it's actually kind of annoying sometimes. They will only start drinking their smoothie if Renee starts reading the Bible. If he does not read the Bible, so if, if we travel and God forbid we forget the Bible, no one is eating breakfast, you know, because they're like, we can't, we can't drink our smoothie. And so it, it really, and it's, a, but it's like the coolest thing, right? And so they'll, and, and one of the, one of the habits that I even had with them is they know that after lunchtime or whatever, they know I'm going to work out at some point. And the other day I was so tired and River's like, you still haven't worked out. I said, oh, River, I'm just, I'm really not feeling very good. He goes, well, you should really work out. And he's like, if you want, I'll sit there with you. But why? Because he sees it. It was almost like weird in his day to not see that. And so I was like, yeah, you need to, you need to go work out. And he said it. And I said, okay, River, I get it. Let's go. Right? And so it's the same thing. Kids will pick up on it in an amazing way. And then in the end, they're going to be the ones, you know, teaching us. Yes, Eugene. So to Diane's thing, something that works really well for us is when we role play, because my girls love to act, mm, good. and they love role play. So at the dinner table, we're like, we talk about a scene with other kids or our kids. Okay. In this situation, when this happened, when that person said that, when that person, the kids did that, you know, let's talk about how, like, good, good option and a not so good option. Mm -hmm. What would, you know, so, so role playing it together and having those conversations, what would you do when, what would mm. you do if, you know? That seemed to like enliven that situation because it's like monkey see, monkey do, but even talking about the reality of that situation, for them it's like real. Yeah. Like they do that. That's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So keep going. But I do have a couple of questions. Yes. Well, on that, Suji, mm. and sometimes you just give a concrete thing, right? Where it's like when someone does something, yeah. you say please and thank you. The other yeah. day, because Absolutely. the kids, are, kid, I, I, I can assure you, your kids will answer all of my questions in the right way. I have no doubt about it, right? So the other day, River and Reed, whatever, and I said, Reed, Reed, could you please share with your brother? He's like, no, I don't want to. Role play. I said, well, what if, what if he had to and you had none? What would you want him to do? Oh, I would love for him to give me one, but I'm not going to give him one. <laughs> and so I was like, he knows knowledge. And that's like, he knew what the right things is. And then it was like, okay, so how can we go one step further? Let, let's, let's pray. Let's ask Jesus. Or it's sometimes it's like, you're going to give it to him. Whether you want to it or not, you're going to give it to him because it's the right thing to do. And the right thing does not require your feelings to do it. Because truly, I, I, I know your girls, like the kids here, they know what the right thing to do is. Guess what, mom and dad? We know what the right thing to do is. Do we always do it? Right? So that's hard. But absolutely, I love role play. Works well until Reed, you know, gives me a kick in the, in the gut. Says, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not going to do it. So what if we've screwed up with our kids and discipline and anger? Mm, good. So... I'm going to assume here that no one is perfect and that as soon as we leave this church, not everyone's going to put their wings on and we're all going to fly off to heaven, right? The reality is, yes, there are moments where we have an anger um, spanked or spoken appropriately. And the first thing is what we would do with any sin, because that is a sin, right? Is that we go to Jesus and we ask for repentance and forgiveness. In Acts, it says that Jesus gives us repentance and forgiveness because truly, sometimes you don't even feel sorry for the sin, but for the consequence. And so we go to Jesus and we repent and we, he will grant us forgiveness. And then the step number three is it's this word on trauma, right? Trauma, trauma, trauma. Everyone says they're traumatized. What is, what is trauma? It's only bad situations that don't get processed well. 
And so after maybe I spanked in anger or I yelled and I frightened, you know, the child, if I get that situation and I then work through it, if I sit everyone down or sit down and then I go through, hey, this is what mom did, but this is what mom, mom wasn't supposed to do this. And I have a conversation and I do the role play, mm -hmm. right? That will not get registered as traumatic for the child. So we have to go through the process of repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation. And then when we come in reconciliation, then there's that. And it's, will you forgive mom? When we apologize, the child forgives, and now it's a tickle fest, it's a pillow fest or whatever. That, that situation will not stay registered. But if it does still, we see that it is still registering. Like we mm -hmm. see something will trigger her mm -hmm. to feel, go into her like sad spot. Mm -hmm. um, then do we just go through that cycle again. I would go through that and cycle revisit. again and revisit it I, and have an have mm -hmm. open conversation. Hey, I noticed that when this happened, it triggers you with it. Can you tell me what's going on there? Because we know um, the two things, right? I can ask, nowhere in the Bible does it say forgive yourself. You know, people always say, I have a hard time forgiving myself. Yeah, because the Bible never tells you to forgive yourself. The Bible tells you to accept the forgiveness of God, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. tell you to forgive yourself. We can't, we can't forgive ourselves. And so when we've hurt someone, and then now we specifically probably, we're gonna pray for that incident. So maybe I hurt you so bad and you're having a hard time forgiving someone else because guess what, as human beings, I have a hard time also forgiving. And I know that forgiving someone is not something that Amanda can do or Suji could do. The Spirit of God has to do through me. And so maybe we're gonna be intentional about praying the next week about that specific event to see if you can maybe forgive mom or maybe forgive dad, you know? And then comes, and these are the ways that I've been improving. Cause it's like, hey, I know I really hurt you in here. And then your actions will show that like, one thing is like, I messed up and I keep doing it versus I messed up and I've changed it. We're having a conversation about it. We're praying about it. Um, and then it's a process like anything. Right. So one more question. Yeah. So we're building, so again, in the children thing, so we're helping them with their good habits now. Is there like an age or a maturity level? Like what am I looking for where I say, because I'm tired, tell them all the time, we're laying the foundation for you, mm -hmm. but there's going to be a point. I'm, you're not going to ask me about little details, what goes in your mouth, what, what you do with your time. Like, you know, you're going to have to make your own choices. So is there a time or a maturity level, like the benchmarks that we're looking for, where we say, you know mm -hmm. what, now you're on your own person. I know the Jewish culture was the bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah around the early teens. But like, is there something like guidelines so that seem to work? A age is hard just because what you just said, yeah. right? Every kid has a different maturity level, right? And maybe for someone, um, a particular sin that we've been creating a habit for, but like maybe that's harder. So like for this friend of mine who were doing the, the, the juice thing, like, for her, sugar is like a, a real thing. Like it's a hard thing. For someone else, maybe it, it'll be like excessive amounts of meat. I don't know, whatever the case may be, or alcohol or whatever. And so because for everyone it's different things, I don't know that we'll always have to stop instilling habits. So obviously we're doing our part, truly. I, I would say like when, when they're out from under your roof, there's like basic things, right? They should be able to wake up and go brush their teeth without you having, but like there's also like tough things that is gonna have to be continuous because there are things as adults that we have, oh, I had a really good month of waking up and seeking Jesus and reading my Bible. And then that last month, it was not so great. And sometimes we do kind of like up and down and roller coaster. I don't think that's gonna be any different with our, with our children. Even when they know what the right thing to do is, we've seen them choose the right thing and then they're gonna mess up. Right, because the righteous man falls seven times, right? But the wicked falls once. But as long as they're giving themselves up and trying again, but I think, you know, I don't know that there's an age. You know, Ellen White says that all the, the character formation that you really have to like seven, eight years old, but we also do know that you can teach an old dog new tricks. And so as long, if my children are in my house, I'm going to continue with that habit, that habit. And again, obviously then they're gonna start getting more independence, right? I'm not gonna be nagging all the time and whatever. And then I like this little formula. Freedom equals responsibility, which equals love. And so, hey, what are all of your responsibilities and what are all your freedoms? And you lose these responsibilities if you're not being 
Um, if you, you lose all these freedoms if you're not being responsible, and the way we measure that is with love. It's, you're doing something that's not good for you or to someone else. So just some tips, but truly, I think habits is something that all of us are working on. For, as soon as we stop it, it's no longer a habit. It's actually it's a lifetime thing, I think. Yeah, it's a lifetime thing. You're just like, I feel like you're a guide to, you're a guide to adults. I mean, it doesn't, I don't think you ever grow old past that. I think that you're always constantly guiding others where you can, mm -hmm. where you can provide wisdom, right? Right, right. Absolutely. And there are some areas in our lives where maybe that childlike will come out and maybe an immaturity will come out. Um, they were in, in the, the, the blessing of a parent book, which I'll send to Suji for you to read. It's really great. And in it, he gives an example. He says that there was this man and he just like he was out of control with like sex. And his wife is just like, literally, like, I can't, I can't take it anymore. Like, but it's like out of control. And she's like, listen, I'm, I'm more than willing participant and I love sex, but like at some point, like too much is too much. And so they went to try to figure out like, where is this obsession coming from? And long story short, they were able to see that as a child, he didn't get a whole lot of affection from his mom. And so now his affection became like sexually. Right, and he an obsession, a sexual where like he wanted his wife to meet, and it's so interesting. Where in prayer, you know, the pastors they're praying with them, and they're praying and asking God, and the pastor says, "Listen, the only person who's going to fulfill this affection that you need at this level that you need it, it's not sexually with your wife, it's God, and God is El Shaddai, which is He is what you need, right? He is the God who gives you what you need, whatever." But the literal translation of El Shaddai is the double-breasted one. How crazy is that? The double-breasted one. And so all this affection and you know, tenderness that he was supposed to get from mom that he didn't get, he was going to get an El Shaddai, the God who gives him what he needed. And in his situation, El Shaddai meant the double-breasted one. I thought that was absolutely, it was incredible. It was amazing. And so, again, there are moments where, like, see, here's a grown man. He was doing well in finances with the kids. But in this particular area, he went, like, childlike. And then habits had to come in, right? And then, listen, only God can do this. El Shaddai, let's create habits because your wife cannot be your mom. Like, it's not going to work that way. And it, it was incredible. And that was it. And he went to God as a child, as, like, hey, El Shaddai, hey, double-breasted one, like, I need to sit in your lap. And my yearning and my affection and that kind that I was supposed to receive from mom for whatever reason I didn't, but I'm here to receive it from you now. Amen. Really cool, right? I was like, man, that's a... It's like, Renee, El Shaddai means double-breasted one. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right? I think that's it, right? Okay, so awesome. If um, I'll see you guys then on Friday at 8 p.m. All right? You're welcome.